Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. The world sometimes seems to be hurtling towards yet another economic crash. Currencies oscillating, growth going into reverse, trade deals stalling, financial institutions bankrupt, at least of credibility. In Britain, add the shambolic lurch towards Brexit into the mix, and no wonder the markets are all over the place. One of Britain's most brilliant economists, Lord Magdi Desai of the London School of Economics and the House of Lords, might be best placed to explain where we are and where we're headed. And it's an honour for us, and he has many an honour, that he's here on board the Sputnik. Lord Desai, thanks for joining us. Thank you. There's a run on the Marmite. The shelves <laughs> are empty. The pound is at a 168-year low. The markets don't know what shock is coming next. Are we headed to hell in a handcart? I think we're headed for two kinds of hell in a handcart. <laughs> First of all, UK will realize slowly what the Brexit decision means, and especially if hard Brexit is going to be argued, because that says that we will give up access to single market We'll have to rebuild all of our trade relations. That will take anywhere between three to five years, maybe six years. So there's a lot of uncertainty. And not everybody is sure that it's going to come out right in the end. But the other thing is, interest rates have been low for a very long time. A lot of cash is around. But the cash is not in people's hands. It is in the vaults of banks and corporates. They have been buying old capital, old shares, mergers and acquisition, those things are going up. And so there is an asset bubble. And one of these days, this asset bubble is going to crash. The question is, you know, will they be able to do something before that or not? You know, you saw Deutsche Bank, uh, you know, one of the biggest bank in Germany, was very much on the brink of collapse 10 days ago. We still don't know whether it'll, it's out of no, it. No, they haven't not. announced whether they're yeah, bailing yeah, it out exactly, or it's yeah. escaped uh, death or what. Uh, yeah. And so there is a lot of fragility in the system. And while on one hand everybody says oh, low interest rates are fine, they're not very good for the stock market. Mm. So what we have right now is some possibility, let's say, of a repeat of 2008, uh, another financial crash. And then we will be stuck in this another little bout of recession, if that happens. One of the things to infer from what you have just said is that this is not just a British problem. Yeah. If, uh, if Germany's biggest bank might be bust, uh, then it's clearly not necessarily related to Brexit. You might argue Brexit exacerbates yeah. pre-existing yeah. problems, but clearly the German Deutsche Bank sure. isn't going bust because Britain <laughs> voted to yeah. leave yeah. the European Union. The instability in the world economic system uh, affecting even China, though mm -hmm. its problems I wish we had, <laughs> exactly. its uh, rate of growth. Yeah. India, for example, India, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, uh, South Africa, uh, Brazil is in uh, negative territory yeah, now, absolutely. where we used yeah. to talk about it as a burgeoning mm -hmm. economy. It's capitalism that's sick, isn't it? Well, you know, my, my, I, have a, I have a view that capitalism very often falls sick to get rid of the weaker things and then it kind of bounces back. So, I mean, it is not like the terminal crisis of capitalism. We've been waiting for that for a very long time. But I think, in a sense, people overdo things, buy expensive assets, they have asset bubbles. Then the whole thing crashes, then you reconstruct. But one thing has happened. Today we think of China and India as substantially big economies. Fifty years ago, Henry Kissinger was saying, man full of wisdom, if only India and China can feed themselves, the world will have no problems. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, this is 1966, yeah. exactly 50 yeah. years ago. In our lifetime, yeah. In our lifetime. And so now the, the center of gravity ha of the world economy has moved eastwards. Mm. Sorry, can I just so, go back to, um, to the British uh, situation yeah. uh, and the asset bubble that you were sure. talking about? Because a lot of people are, are interested in this question. London remains the most expensive 
place for houses to uh, purchase. And prices have just bounced back, by the way. Mm -hmm. So what is that all about? A lot of people were anticipating, you know, a drop. Fallen prices, yeah. yeah. In, the, in the house prices. Now, you know, the th thing about house prices is that, A, we haven't built any any affordable houses. You know, the 13 years of Labour government, we didn't actually replace any of the council house stocks. And, you know, as population grows, land is always scarce. Mm. But other thing is, we have thrown ourselves open for the, you know, for the runaway capital exactly. of the entire world to come and invest well, exactly. here. Exactly, that's what I mean. And if you, if, and you, if you buy, if you, you know, everybody thinks if you buy a London house, is better than the uh, uh, money the banks is the back of the back of Probably England. much safer. Like, <laughs> much safer. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, are, you are generating this, uh, this boom. And you taught people that house prices going up is a good thing. Which it isn't. It, which it isn't. You know, we don't have a rental market, of uh, we're speaking of. Some, some European countries do have very good rental yeah. markets. Almost we, all. Yeah, yeah. yeah Almost we all have deliberately, rented. Yeah, we deliberately destroyed the renting sector, both social and private, and we are leaving people with no other choice but to buy. Buy, buy, buy. Mm. And I've, I've said again and again in, in the House of Lords, why don't we actually create a renting market? Mm. Mm. Because, you know, house is not the only asset people can have. They can have something else as an asset. Why, why, why does everybody get stuck yeah. in, in... It's a, a non-performing asset, a non -performing economic asset, exactly. Yeah. You know, if you buy a car and then you sell it three years later, it will have depreciated he lose money. Mm. Mm. Everybody thinks that house price will always go up, will yeah. never go down. Yeah, that's a very good point. Let me go back to Brexit, because yeah. that's oh, the yeah. issue of the sure. moment, of course. Pound is at a 168-year low. Bad news if you've got a lot of pounds <laughs> and you're trading them. Bear in mind, mm -hmm. 16 million people in Britain have less than 100 pounds in the bank, sure. and many millions more don't have a bank account and are up to their ears yeah. in debt. So doesn't necessarily affect the man and woman in the street all that much, except when it comes to imports. Yeah. Therefore, import substitution, British manufacturers, British producers can come into the market, compete with uh, foreign imports more cheaply. Mm -hmm. British exporters can sell their goods abroad more cheaply. Why is it held to be unreservedly a bad thing that the pound is falling in value? You know, the things that you described are longer-run effects. You know, to, mm. to start our own industries, mm. to, to have manufactured brought back. So exports will grow up. What happens, what's happening right now, is the thing we export most, services, i.e. tourists coming here mm. as an export. And that you see, you know, there's a buzz in the market that you know, tourists are coming to, to, for London, the pound is cheap and so on. That will be there. But to, to have a sustainable manufacturing to replace, you require the pound to be permanently low mm. because you're competing with, uh, not, you're not competing with just European countries, you're competing with you know, Indonesia and Malaysia and China and India. So I think that kind of strategy, you have to have five or ten year perspective on that. You can't just one morning say, OK, we're going to have our own industry. So the way to do this, first of all, I think the pound is overshot, in my view. It's, it's, it's gone back down much more than it should have. The markets are worried, the world is worried as what we are doing by going for a hard Brexit. And the idea that Mrs. May proudly says, Theresa May proudly says, I am for a hard Brexit. People say, but what's going to happen to your trade? What's going to happen to your income? You know, our firm's going to relocate from here into on the continent or just maybe go to Ireland or whatever it is. But there is going to be an impact on this. Okay, you don't want people coming in from Europe, migrants? Yes, but what what price are you willing to pay for that? And that price has not been clarified. No, but the scene is set. Uh, I'm myself campaigning for a general election where these two routes, Brexit is a given, that's what the referendum decided, hard or soft, yeah. can be, there can be a mandate for either. 
And the only way to get that mandate is a general election. You say, and you're right, Mrs May has painted herself into a corner, mm. a corner called hard Brexit. Uh, that leaves Labour the opportunity sure. of being the soft Brexit yeah, party. Yeah. I, I fancy uh, <laughs> Labour to win that contest, whatever my own point of view. I think, yes, if Labour does an intelligent soft Brexit strategy, stays united... You know, and I think the further program of reforming EU and all that, we can we can leave aside for a while. Right now, it's a Brexit we are arguing for. And it'll have to say, yes, we are going to come out, but we are going to come out much with, under much better conditions than what, what this other lot are, are risking. So I think that would be... Now, as you know... Uh, we have this fixed on Parliament Act, and so there is a problem about can we get a two-thirds majority to change the date of the election. Now, that is where I think the subtlety arises. How can Labour convince the Tories that now is the time to have an election? I mean, remember what they were saying about Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown has no legitimacy because he'd become prime minister without an election. Yeah. Now, same thing applies to, uh, to Theresa May, yeah. you know. And so, if they can be convinced, no, I think it events will, might convince them. Events might. I think if the pound were to go below a dollar, below parity, that would be a very big yeah. shock. You know, that, that, there is a psychological barrier yeah. there. Mm -hmm. you know, this Marmite story is very interesting because that the first time ordinary people's lives are shown to be affected by Brexit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and a, a dawning on people that such great British institutions exactly. as Marmite <laughs> <Exactly>. and even <laughs> HP Sauce are actually imports. <laughs> They're not ours uh, yeah, anymore. Yeah, then, yeah. Now you, uh, uh, in a word, because we've, uh, we're out of time, sure. you've tried to repeal the Fixed Term Parliament Act yeah. very nobly. Mm. Is there a point in the Lords trying again? Oh no, I'm, I'm waiting for my second reading date. So it might go through? It might go through. I mean, it's only a one close bill. Lord Desai, I could talk to you all day. I could listen to you all day. Thanks very much for coming on board the Sputnik. Thank you. Coming up next, Professor Guy Standing, a pioneer of basic income. Don't miss it. Welcome back to Sputnik. Professor Guy Standing of the Development Studies Department of the School of Oriental and African Studies is a co-founder of BN which means good in French, or Basic Income Earth Network, or maybe both. He campaigns, as it says on the tin, for everyone to have a basic income, regardless of anything, really. I've never entirely grasped what that means, so I, as well as you, might well learn something today because Professor Standing is here with us with his new book, The Corruption of Capitalism, Why Rentiers Thrive and Work Doesn't Pay. He's just flown in from Geneva and joins us now. Professor Guy, thanks very much for coming. Do you mean that capitalism is corrupt or that something is corrupting capitalism? I, I think both apply, but in particular what I'm arguing in the book is that the proponents of capitalism claim that they're in favour of free markets. And that is a fundamental lie about yes. what's happened it in is. the last 30 years yes. of globalisation. It's not free markets at all. No. You could claim, and I argue in the book, that what they've done is construct the most unfree market system that's ever been devised. That's a strong statement, but it begins with the realisation that capitalism in the globalised context has changed in character, fundamentally changed in character. And the character is today rentier capitalism. In other words, the return to property and assets is shot up and the returns to labour and the returns to producing goods and services have both shot down. It's a, it's a very strange thing. And what's happened is that the income distribution system of the 20th century has broken down. I'll give you a few facts that support that uh, assertion. Traditionally, in the middle decades of the 20th century, the share of income going to capital and the share going to labour was roughly stable. You know, it was a social consensus. But in the last 30 years, across the world, the share going to capital has gone up, the share going to labour has gone down. 
And within those two shares, the share going within capital to rentiers, who are earning from rent, has shot up. And within the labour share, the share going to the top part through forms of rent has also shot up. So you have a double whammy for the group that I've been analysing, the precariat, because what has happened is a new class... So-called because of the precarious nature... No, uh, no, no, not that. Please. Be the class structure that's emerged with globalisation, you have a plutocracy, an oligarchy, l earning rents by mm -hmm. bucketfuls. Then you have a, a salariat, shrinking employment, security, pensions, and all of those things. The old proletariat which social democrats and the unions and the rest supported in the 20th century is shrinking everywhere and the precariat is underneath but it's a class because it's not an underclass global capitalism wants a supply of people who are being prepared to accept unstable labor without a sense of future without a sense of occupation mm. but the precariat is growing and at the moment it's a disorganized mass, some people are what I call atavists, they're falling out of all working class communities, they don't have a university educational thing, and this group tends to listen to the populists, the Trumps, the Brexit debate, Marine Le Pen, they follow that sort of populist message. But there's another part of the precariat, which is the young, educated, who are coming out of university and college, they were promised by their parents and their teachers to have a future. They don't have a future. So if you're in the precariat, you're facing a life of declining real wages, bumping along more and more volatile, living on the edge of unsustainable debt, where one accident, one mishap, one bad decision, you tip, you're tipped out. And that existential fear is real, a real outcome of what's been happening. Now, the rent is being earned fundamentally by intellectual property. The intellectual property regime that I discussed there is enormously more powerful than it was 20 years ago. Since the passage of TRIPS in 1995, the number of patents has tripled. Each and every patent guarantees the patent holder 20 years of monopoly income. We have copyrights which have multiplied the income from all forms of these intellectual property, so-called, has been shooting up exponentially. So it's taking a vast proportion of total global income. It's a, it's a parasite on the process. But in addition, our governments, other governments, have been indulging in beggar my precariat type of fiscal policy, if you follow my meaning, by indulging in subsidies. Huge millions and millions of pounds are spent by governments in giving rich corporations and oligarchs subsidies to encourage them to come to our country or to stay here or patent the patent box type of, you know, gift to the winners. And these are regressive. They are sucking money out of the exchequers and every country is competing on the same sort of thing. A race to the bottom. A race to the bottom, <clears throat> but through subsidies. The subsidies create part of the government debt. So then you have your austerity logic that we have to reduce debt because of what happened in the financial crash so they're paying out on subsidies they're paying out tax cuts corporation tax cuts income tax cuts for the rich allowances etc etc so they say well we've got to try and balance the budget so we've got to cut benefits we know where that leads it's a, a brilliantly uh, wow. uh, uh, described context how does the basic income demand fit into this? And how can it be afforded? And okay. is it just here or everywhere? Well, very, I've been advocating basic income for 30 years. For a long time, we were regarded as mad, bad, and dangerous to know. In the last couple of years, we've suddenly become respectable, so I'm getting a bit worried. I get invited on your program. <laughs> I, I should be really worried. And, and, and it's an interesting thing, because every single day, I get emails and contacts from a wide variety of types, from the left to the far right. And I've just been invited to speak at the World Economic Forum in Davos on basic income. You've I really mean, made it. Yeah. I've really made it. Yeah. I, now I really must look in the mirror and be careful. <laughs> but the situation is this. 
That income distribution system has broken down. Just to give you another couple of facts to, to indicate the problem. It used to be when I was an economic student that when productivity went up, wages went up. But in the last 30 years, the jaws of the snake have been opening. Productivity has gone up, not very much in some countries, but in some quite a lot, but wages have been going down. It used to be the case when profits went up, wages went up. I don't know, seemed fair. The last 30 years, snakes' jaws open. It used to be the case when employment went up, wages went up. But if you look at the recent record, it's the, it's the opposite. Right, yeah. Yeah. So this means the system has broken down. Okay? Now, what we can see is that we need to revive and create a new income distribution system for this global capitalism. And the way to do it is to do what John Maynard Keynes said would happen. But he hadn't foreseen the, interde the intellectual property rights regime. But he said we need to achieve the euthanasia of the rentier. Put him to I'm death. Up, I'm up for that. <laughs> you are. So am I. But how do we do it in the 21st century? What we've got to do is capture that rent, all those forms of rent, which are amoral, inefficient, distort markets. So even on, even on a blatant capitalist line, they can't justify it. OK? You and I would disagree with with it for different reasons. Mm. But even on their own grounds, they can't defend this sort of rentier situation. And using debts, you know, securitization, all these fancy gadgets by which the financiers are sucking rental income out of the precariat, they can't justify that. So what we should be doing is working towards a system where you create capital funds, sovereign wealth funds, democratically controlled sovereign wealth funds, which a number of countries are moving into creating, and using those funds to help pay for a basic income. That's part of the creation of a new income distribution system. You can also roll back the subsidies, cutting all those regressive subsidies, to help in the funding of a basic income. Now, you said in your introduction, and perfectly fairly, that you never fully understood what it means and you're not the first person to say that to me, what it means is this, that any good society, every man, every woman, and every child should have basic security, basic economic security. The best way is the simplest way, to make sure that every individual, as a citizen, as a legal resident in our country, should have a basic income covering their basic needs. That means it should be universal, it should be unconditional in behavioural terms, as long as you obey the law of the land, it should be individual, and it should be universal in the sense that everybody has the right to it as a legal resident. It's much better than means testing, which has huge problems, as we know, and it's affordable. Anybody who says it's not affordable has not been looking at the figures on rentier capitalism, on the subsidies, on, on the huge expenditures that, that are currently exist with tax credits and things like that. It's affordable. And the standard argument that if you gave a person a basic income, they would become lazy. They wouldn't work. They wouldn't work. We've done pilots in a number of countries, which we've reported in the books and, and, and in a special book on basic income, shows that people who have basic security work more, not less. Well, I know a lot more now. Professor Guy Standing, thanks for coming on Thank the you. Sputnik. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? So we're talking economics this week. So we asked the people, is the world economy on the edge of a cliff? And Linda answers, well, maybe capitalism has reached its tipping point. And our very own Theresa May says, don't worry, George, I know some nice little places in Panama to keep your pennies safe. <laughs> Well, of course, that's uh, part of the rentier issue that uh, Professor Standing was talking about. It's not that wealth isn't generated, it's that it is in the hands Inequal. of a tiny number of people. 64 individuals own as much wealth as half of the entire world's population. That's 64 own more than 4 billion people. 
mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. Couldn't make up. That's all the tweets uh, we have time for today. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. But you can stay in touch with us on social media through Twitter, RT underscore Sputnik, or on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.